Morning, Church. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Okay. We have entered into the fourth Sunday in Lent. Um, fourth Sunday is also known as the le- later part of Lent. Later in our um, Holy Communion ritual, you will notice that the ritual is slightly different. Pay attention to what is different there. And in, from this second part of Lent onwards, on this fourth Sunday, our sermon texts, especially the narrative of, uh, in the book of Numbers, help us to see how God has delivered his people from despair in an amazing way. Now, Lent, the whole season of Lent, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is the main focus. We meditate on Jesus, how he has prepared himself to go on this road on Calvary. All scriptures in Lent from the Old Testament is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ's way of salvation. And they all point towards Jesus. Um, in Numbers chapter, uh, chapter 21, this event occurred at the very near end of Israel's 40 years journey through the wilderness. You realize that God delivered his people, it's a little bit of the background, God delivered his children, the children of Israel from Egypt 40 years earlier. However, this passage from Numbers 21, they are coming to that close. It's about 39 to 40 years already. And when they were brought out from Egypt, because of the lack of faith and rebellion against God, the Lord sentenced the entire nation to wander in the wilderness until, the Bible says, until all members over 20, the age of 20, who had grumbled against God, died. Except two people. Do you know who are the two? Except Caleb and Joshua. And do you know how long did it take for that generation to all die? How many years? Since the, the, they came out from Egypt? 38 years. 38 years. And now in this text, we see the second generation of people. Some of them were younger than 20 years old. Some were just born while they were wandering in the wilderness for 38 over years. And here in verse 4 tells us that from Mount Hall, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Edom, I circle that. Edom was there. So they came all the way down to Mount Sinai and now Edom. And they had to go around. Why do they have to go around? Because in chapter 20, verse 14 onwards, says, it tells us that Edomites would not allow them to pass through their land. If they were able to just pass through that Edom, and on top of that, that uh, um, if they go straight, they will be able to enter into the land of Cana, the promised land. But Edom refused. So they have, they, this forced Israelites to cross the extremely harsh desert terrain. It was mountainous, rough, and desolate. To go another round, took them, them another almost one year. Instead of going straight into the promised land, another round. And the people didn't like it. 
Don't forget, we are talking about the second generations. Not the first generations whom had witnessed for themselves the miraculous work of God that opened the Red Sea for them to walk through dry land and how God had been with them, led them with pillar of cloud and pillar of uh, um, fire. Okay, so they, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are listening. Good, good. So this second generations, second generations, they did not, they, they somehow had that experience, but they didn't like extra, extra round. And they, what did they do? The scripture continued to tell us that the people became impatient on the way. Impatient. Pay attention to the word impatient. Don't just take impatient too lightly. Sometimes a lot of things become snowball. It started with that little impatient. The word impatient gives us the idea of something being shortened. The temples are short. They are frustrated. And they are out of patience with the entire process of getting to Cana. And this impatience, it is like something that is so contagious. Someone impatience and you got it, and you get frustrated, and you also get impatience and start come up. And in verse 5, their voice, they, this impatience led them to voice several complaints. What do they complain? They complained that God and Moses brought them out of Egypt just to have them died in the wilderness. Complain about God, complain about their leader. And then they could move on to complain about lack of food, lack of water. No food, no water. But is this the fair com complaint? If there isn't any food at all, how could they survive through this terrible wilderness for so many years, for so many people? And if there's no water, how could they ever survive through three days? Because this was in the heat sun in the wilderness. God give them water, food. But the food wasn't what the food that they expected. God gave them manna. Do you know what's manna? You remember what manna is? Ah, like hot flakes. Delicious now. Delicious. God sent manna. And it fell on the camp at night. It was plentiful. It was tasty. It was nutritious. No other food. But manna itself can keep them healthy, going. It was a gracious gift from God to feed his people, his hungry people. And now, once the impatience become complaint, complaint keep rolling, and complain about lack of food, lack of water, now they even complain about manna. They say, we are sick of this tailless food. We don't like it. Tired of it. Our church, as we know, Old Testaments are the foreshadow pointing towards the whole work of Jesus Christ. He came to save sinners. This is our sinful nature, common nature. Do you ever find ourselves often in a similar state of discontent? Do we even allow doubt and disbelief to fill our hearts so much that these feelings block our eyes from God's presence and God's power? God has been with us. God has been give, leading and, and doing works. But sometimes when there is dissatisfaction, the Hokkien said Bo Song. You know it's Bo Song. You just don't like it. When you don't like it, it just covered our eyes and we don't see. We do not be 
around God's blessing and we only see things that we don't like. The Israelites complained and complained. Do you think we are better off than them? What do people call Singaporeans? Louder, louder. Can I to say that? Complain king. <laughs> we, we like to com complain, complain and complain. And then, this dissatisfaction quickly spread to the entire population. Everyone start nagging. Everyone start grumbling. When it turns from one person to a smaller group and to a big group of people, what happened? What is the con was the consequences? Here in the historical account, this very real event, having been graced and led by God alone in the wilderness for so many years, but coming towards the end, nearing the end, this second generation took up this human sinfulness to complain. God had to do something. God would not allow this to happen so that they carried this with them, magnified it, and bring it into the promised land. Then what's the point of going into a promised land? Why not? And what does what was the, the scripture says? God sent fiery serpents. They were being beaten by the fiery serpents, and many people were dying. For Israel, this situation quickly degenerated into a hopeless situation. Snakes was everywhere, got beaten. Have you ever wondered why serpent? Instead of so many other things, God could use many other thing, ways to, to uh, punish his people. But at this juncture, why serpent? Why? The serpent, as you know, is a symbol of sin. Satan disguised himself as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Remember? In the Garden of Eden, a snake came and told Eve, can eat, I can, I won't die, I won't die. That was the work of Satan. And throughout the Bible, the serpent is a symbol of sin, evil, rebellion against God. And now, it was fitting that the Lord sent the serpent as a judgment on a complaining people. There was no escape from the snake. There was no treatment from snake bites. They were trapped in hopeless circumstances from which they could not escape. Friends, have you ever experienced this? You are trapped in a situation that you just can't find a way out. You thought that was the end. No way out. No way out. What should you do? What should you do? You only have two choices when you are beaten by a deadly snake or in a hopeless situation. One, you can sit and die. Just accept. Die. No way out. I die. Or you can get up and do something about it. The Israelites choose to do something about the situation. They took three steps to overcome their complaint, the C. Now they took three C. What were those three steps? The first step was conviction. There was conviction. The Bible says, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Now, church, no matter 
what else you do until you get to the point in your life where you are convicted of your sin and sincerely repent and say, I have sinned. Otherwise, no matter what else you do, you cannot be saved. We can tell the people that, yay, this is wrong, this is wrong, but until that, pers that person is convicted in his heart alone, himself. Remember the prodigal son in the New Testament, Luke chapter 15? He wanted to go his way. I'm sure his father tried to persuade him, explain the situation to him. The brother scolded him before he, he took the, uh, the, the, uh, all the belongings and go far away. But until he came to the pit of his situation, there was this conviction. He knew that I've wrong, I've done wrong. So this is the conviction. So the Israelites, this second generation, Come to a point, the people choose, instead of sitting there and die, seeing one, one die, the other also die, one after another, we have better admit that we have done wrong. And with this conviction comes confession. What's the difference between conviction and confession? The people, the Bible said, they went on and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Now, the conviction is always followed by concrete confession. You cannot just say, I've sinned. I'm sorry. Sorry for what? What have you done wrong? I remember my, my, my children have often heard me say this since they were little. I told them, don't just say you are sorry. Tell me what you did wrong. You know what you have done wrongly? Tell it. And don't just tell me. You first, if you are really sorry, now, let us pray now. You confess to the Heavenly Father first. Then you say sorry to mommy. My, I remember my son, little one, Ask him, what have you done wrongly? Mm, still, 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 I uh, didn't want to say. But when he said, come, let's pray. It is in the prayer when he said, Father God, sorry, I shouldn't have uh, snatched the pen from my older brother and uh, say bad word to, to him, even scolded him. I'm sorry. But when he said that, tears came down. Because when you really turn to God and Make your confession. The Holy Spirit is there, working, helping the heart to be truly repentant. And then after that, he said, Mommy, sorry, I hug him. Okay, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. And this is from moving from conviction to confession. The Israelites told Moses that we have sinned and we have spoken against the Lord and against you. And after confession, the third C is contrition. There is repentance. Contrition means your heart really feels that you don't want to be in this situation anymore. I want to turn. I want to turn back, willing to turn back to God. The people went on to say, told Moses, pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. Pray to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. These are the three steps from overcoming, complaining, use conviction, confession, and contrition. And Bible says, so Moses prayed for the people. And this is a decisive step when they realize that their only hope is in God and are willing to turn to him for help. Church, my dear brothers and sisters, are you willing? Are you sometimes feel that I'm trapped in certain state that I could not be set free from that? 
Pray that the Holy Spirit will give you that conviction and dare to tell God that I have sinned and confess that, Lord, forgive me because of my short temper, my discontent or too proud. Say and then turn back to God. And after this, these three things, we see along with the punishment came pardon because our God is a God that never just punish for the sake of punish. And this is the magnificent truth that I want you to see today. This passage teaches us that there is hope for the hopeless. There is hope. No matter what situation you are in, remember, there is hope. God has his amazing way of redemption, but it must be his way. No more, no less. Don't ever turn to God, pray to God, God help me, help me this way, this way. You, have, uh, uh, you, you punish my boss. God, you uh, uh, turn, turn the situation as if we are the one to tell God what to do. When we turn to God, we really just need to come with a humble heart and allow God to deliver us in his way, in his time. No less, no more. Uh, what is God's amazing way of redemption? Verse 8 continues to tell us that, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is beaten, when he sees it, shall live. Shall live. Now, when, whenever we read the scripture, don't just read like this. Dare to ask ourselves some real questions. When I come to this passage, why, why, use, why use a bronze serpent, a fiery serpent set on a pole? Isn't it a very strange way to save life? Right now, have you ever thought of this? So strange. How could this fiery snake Save the lives of those beaten by snakes. This is, of course, incompre uh, incomprehensible to humans. Now, you see, we always expect God to intervene into our situations in great and miraculous way. Ta -da -da -da! Sounding magnificent just happened. And yet, God calls us to obey his instruction in simplicity and humility. Look up and see the pole with the bronze serpent and you will live. That's it? Is it too simple? Again in Hokkien, say, Uyabo. Are you sure? Just look. Yes. It's that simple. It takes us to really believe if we want to have this repentance, contrition, turn to God. When we turn to God, we have to put our trust in God, obey Him, trust and obey, and do it. Just do that. And this is God's wonderful way of redemption. Even if it seems unconventional, healing will come as God's people reject right and humbly obey God's guidance. Do you believe? Do you believe? This passage is a harsh look at the consequences of sin, but it also illustrates the love and grace of God for the hopeless. The New Testament scripture that we heard uh, being read this morning was taken from uh, John chapter 3, a very familiar uh, passage. But this passage record, if you remember just now what was read, it was the uh, record the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, the teacher. Jesus used the lifting up, 
lifting of the snake as an example to show that he would also be lifted up and die for sinners on the cross. See the similarity? The serpent, bronze serpent on the pole looks a little bit at the, at the cross and Jesus is now hanging on the cross. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see the, the comparison, how the Old Testament point towards Jesus. In Numbers 20, the Israelites looked to the bronze serpent provided by God to be saved. And here in New Testament, the world would look to God's provision of a Savior, Jesus Christ, to be saved. The only difference in these two passages is that in Numbers 21, we see only a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas in the New Testament, we see none other than the Lord Jesus himself. It's no longer the bronze snake. It's the Son of God, Son of Man, nailed on the cross, died on the cross for us. But the similarity is that all looked and will be live, shall live in the Old Testament time. God said, you just do that. And people get healed. And in the New Testament, Jesus said, believe and be saved. Believe. Look, at, look upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. There's no other name on earth and heaven that we can call upon, cling unto for our salvation. This is the only way. That's simple. Look at him. Look to Jesus. And this is good news. This is glad tidings. This is God's amazing redemptive work. And so, in, finally, in conclusion, allow me to share with you a, vivid, a story related to this incident with the Israelites. I read it some time ago. I don't remember who wrote it, but this story was so vivid that it, it stayed in me, it impressed me. The story goes like this. In one tent, a mother is bending over the weak, fiery form of her dying son. She has just buried his dead, also beaten by the snake. Now she knows soon she has to bury him. And all of a sudden, a neighbor rushes in and says, your son does not have to die. There is a cure. And mother, with white eye, all in amazement, said, What do I need to do? What do I need to do? She, the neighbor said, Pick him up and bring him out. Get him to look at the fiery serpent on the pole. And the mother quickly carry her son out to, of the tent and put him there, says, Son, look, there it is, look. But the son was too weak with eyes closed. The mother was so eager, she lifted up the head of that little boy and prized open just one of his eyes and says, Son, look! That little boy looks. Does he see? Yes, he sees. He sees it. And with that, you know what happened? The color comes back into his cheeks. The fever leaves the sweating brow. His headache stops. His limbs straighten out. His eyes open and he sits up, he stands up, 
he leaps, he shouts, he dances because he's been totally and wonderfully healed with just simple act, with the simple faith. Lord, my dear brothers and sisters, that was just a serp, bronze serpent on the pole. What about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us, for this universal salvation, not just for the Israelites, but for the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Look to Jesus. That's simple. Just call upon the name of Jesus. And for us Christians, we have got Jesus, but do we continue to look upon him in our daily life, in our many challenges, in our struggles? Do we look upon him? Do we call upon his name? Like the mother said, son, look. If, it is, if you haven't experienced such grace and love of God, we thank God for that and ask the Lord to continue to keep us faithful to Him. Never allow doubt and complain to creep into our heart, no matter what we come by. So we just want to ask God to give us that grateful heart. Keep counting His blessing. Keep calling upon His name. For some of us, if you are yet to experience this, now you are facing something. The scripture tells us, just look upon Jesus, call upon his name. He will save. He's more than happy to save us. And if you have experienced God's redemptive love, healing and grace of Jesus, you will want, to, want it to happen to others. Pray right now for those you know who are in need of God's wonderful salvation. Saying like the mother, son, look, friend, look. Let us spend a brief moment to look upon Jesus and also bring others to ask them to see. Look at Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing love for us. Lord, help us to be grateful for all that you have done for us and help us never, never sway away from you. Keep our eyes focused on you and help us see through our life and this world from your lens. And Lord, we bring before you all our friends and close ones that are in need of your healing touch, in need of your salvation. Open their eyes so that they can look and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray.